Hi, I'm Charlie. And I'm Marty. Thanks for joining our Spring Sustainability Challenge, brought to you by Green Building Education Services, or GBES.com. We created this Sustainability Challenge to give architects and designers the specific knowledge and industry perspective on sustainability that's unique to you. We had a great response to our Fall Sustainability Challenge back in October, right, Marty, 2022. So we decided to do it again during Earth Week with all new content. All right, let's go over some housekeeping. You're going to get two videos each day. You'll get the links in your email each morning. You can also find them on sustainabilityweek.org and on our YouTube channel, Sustainability Challenge Spring 2023. For those of you who want CE credit, there's one quiz at the end of day five, and you'll get instructions on how to self-report for three LEED and AIA CE credits. Watch the two videos each day. We'd like you to keep up. You can watch them on your own or watch them with your teams or colleagues or even your whole office. We're seeing a lot of interest in this bite-sized learning approach. It's a great way to invest in yourself and in your learning in 15-minute increments. We want to hear what you think, so add your comments to the videos. We'll be there reading your comments and responding. Here's how the sustainability challenge will flow. Today is day one. It starts with a level set, four top trends in sustainable building, if you will. The second video is an update on the most popular rating systems. Day two is all about automation in design. How are AI, machine learning, and digital twins changing the business of architecture? In day three, you'll see new conceptual design tools that could dramatically improve your productivity. Day four looks at the implications of these technologies on architecture and design. How will it change? What will stay the same? What steps should be taken now? On day five, we'll hold a QA session that you can join live or watch back later based on the questions we get from you this week. The goal of the sustainability challenge is to help you get ahead of the pack. What are the key trends and technologies that are impacting your profession? As you go through the week, we invite you to reflect on where you are in your learning journey, make a plan to keep learning, and then keep developing your skills. So where are you at on that scale? Where are you at on your scale this week with data and AI and decarbonization and ESG? There's going to be some reflection questions that we don't just leave you with, but we inspire you and tell you where to take some next steps. So thanks for being here. We're really excited to have you here, and we will see you in the comments and tomorrow. Charlie, you spend a ton of time talking to leaders all over the country and around the world. You can offer a unique perspective because you're in many different roles, you're a lead fellow, you're the host of the Green Building Matters podcast, um, and a business leader of a few different companies, of SIG for engineering and sustainability consulting, GBES for education, Blue Ocean Sustainability that makes tools and technologies, and ATOS in remote operations. So with that in mind, can you talk about what you're hearing the green building industry seems to be at an inflection point right now. Thanks, Brian. Um, you know, in the first few months of 2023 so far, you know, I've talked to probably 50 different green building leaders. Uh, we were down in Mexico City recently at an amazing conference. I was out in La Jolla at the Design Futures Council, uh, future of technology within the architecture trade. You know, I know not everybody can devote as much time as, as me to follow these trends. And I really feel privileged that I'm able to do that in my different roles that you mentioned. You know, I feel a responsibility though to share that uh, intel and, and kind of I'm good at cliff notes with an audience, kind of an audience like this, our sustainability challenge this week. You know, so I'm really excited to be here. We have an amazing week planned where we will hit on some of these themes. But Brian, how about you and I right now unpack a few of the themes that, that we're seeing, that I'm seeing, you know, around sustainability uh, early 2023. And one of those first themes is just decarbonization and ESG. There, there has been this transition, this evolution. Some really focus on decarbonization, and we still have a lot of work to do there. But others have really accepted that the new umbrella of green is ESG. You know, we, we hear this statistic again and again, and it bears repeating. The building and construction sectors generate 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, that figure does not account for embodied carbon in the production of materials, building, operations, and construction-related activities. When embodied carbon is factored in, the buildings and construction world are the largest contributors on Earth to greenhouse gases. 
you know, and that's where we've chosen to make our careers, right? In the built environment, this green building movement. You know, that's what we're going to continue to talk about. And, and this theme we're unpacking right now, I'd call it decarbonization first, okay? You know, it's not just uh, buzzwords. You know, these are the, the new categories that a lot of your work is going to need to fit into, you know, like it or not. You know, when I first got into this movement, though, uh, LEED was in its infancy. Um, ever since those early LEED projects through today, LEED is heavily weighted based on carbon emission reduction. If you want to ever be LEED gold or LEED platinum, you have to get cars off the road and you have to save a lot of energy in your building. That's still operating carbon. You alluded to embodied carbon, which we're throwing in, but still all of it fits under decarbonization, right? You know, the terminology for green buildings, it, it just continues to evolve. There's both decarbonization and arguably the bigger umbrella of ESG. Some new strategies that are coming on board that help us get our buildings to net zero. You know, they're, they're everywhere around us. And I, I think we saw a really fun example when we were in Mexico City. Uh, Johnson Controls uh, provides net zero as a service. I was blown away by that. You know, Arup, uh, they're committed to carrying out whole life cycle uh, carbon assessments for all of the projects that they touch across their entire organization. You know, as of November 2022, they say that Arup, they've collected and analyzed data from about a thousand building and design projects across 30 nations on five continents. Another way we are talking about sustainable buildings is in terms of ESG, right? Environmental, social, and governance. You know, these are non-financial factors that investors use to measure uh, an investment into a company or maybe a real estate portfolio. You know, how are they really doing with their sustainability efforts? You know, at SIG, our green building consulting, engineering, and ESG firm, for example, you know, we have publicly traded REITs that are focused on their ESG, trying to increase their GRESB, Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, scores so they can prove to investors that this is a green portfolio, this is a green fund, and they want to go buy more green buildings. So we're starting to see that just, just everywhere we look. You know, I've really spent a lot of time in the green building rating systems again, you know, like LEED. And when you have a lot of LEED certified assets, that definitely helps with your ESG, especially the E part, the environmental impacts. Green building ratings and LEED certified assets, you know, they're used in a variety of sustainable finance and ESG reporting. They can provide validated ESG performance data and peer benchmarks for investors and managers to improve business intelligence and industry engagement. As you may have heard, LEED version 5 is being developed. We have a great bonus video for everyone that's part of our sustainability challenge from Melissa Baker, the Senior VP of the U.S. Green Building Council. We're going to add a link to that video in the comments below. Hey, you know, another trend that we've been discussing is, is climate action. In the past two years, we've seen major progress in federal level climate action through two historic pieces of legislation. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act invests over $550 billion in climate resilient infrastructure, renewable energy, and electric vehicle infrastructure. Meanwhile, the Inflation Reduction Act focuses on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, investing in renewable energy, and promoting energy efficiency. These advances have had a powerful impact on the green building industry, with architects adapting their work to incorporate sustainable design principles and materials to meet this increasing demand for environmentally friendly projects. At the state level, Maryland passed the Climate Solutions Now Act of 2022 back in April of last year, which accelerates their state's sort of interim carbon reduction goal to 60% below 2006 levels by 2031. At, at the city level, uh, Boston Mayor Michelle Wu announced in March 2023 that she wants the city to adopt an aggressive green building code initially drafted last December by the state of Massachusetts. And this specialized code expands on current state policy by requiring that mixed fuel buildings, those using fossil fuels, add wiring for future conversion to electrification and to install solar. The specialized code is resulting in new buildings adhering to 
highly efficient all-electric standards, and one of the three required pathways to approval is a true zero energy site with on-site renewable energy generation that's equal to or greater than the building's annual energy use. In addition, the SEC's landmark proposal is making waves. The proposed enhancement and standardization of climate-related disclosures for investors requires publicly traded companies to disclose to investors how their operations affect the climate and contribute to carbon emissions. And that includes both direct scope one emissions, indirect or scope two greenhouse gas emissions, and scope three emissions, which are the upstream and downstream emissions along the company's entire value chain. That's a tremendous amount of climate action. I know we've been doing this a long time. It seems like it really is all speeding up. And for those watching as part of our sustainability challenge, hey, this is a perfect time to be a part of this movement. Everyone is watching this space. Uh, you've been in this green building movement a long time. So have I. So have all of our subject matter experts that we've asked to be a part of our challenge this week. You know, whatever happens with these monumental pieces of legislation, Brian, we can be sure that more changes are coming and the impacts will be felt. You know, sometimes at the federal level, right? Like we mentioned here in the US, we've got quite a bit of federal uh, legislation getting passed. Sometimes at the state level, you know, here in the state of Georgia where we're based or the city level, New York City, local laws, here's some mandates in Atlanta, out in San Francisco, but don't forget about your company level, right? There are so many private and public companies that say, look, no matter what, the country I'm in, is they're doing, here's what we're going to do. Here's what's important to us with overall sustainability and especially our impact and especially even our real estate or maybe even the next big project you get to work on. Maybe just apply some green best practices, even if it's not going for lead platinum or living building challenge. Okay. You know, change is coming, Brian, at all of these levels more than ever, and it's definitely speeding up. I read an interesting piece in Fortune magazine recently. Uh, Diane Hoskins, she's the co-CEO of Gensler, you know, largest architect in the world. Um, she wrote that the proposed call to report scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions for the real estate investment trust, REITs, and other traded real estate almost immediately could lead to a national framework for the entire industry. You know, things will change sooner than later. Uh, Brian, let's talk about a third trend, uh, adaptive reuse. You know, coming out of the pandemic, there's an overall decline in demand for traditional office space. So there's a drive to adaptive reuse. You know, maybe an office building gets used for housing or a school or retail space. Yeah, in the first quarter of 2021, as cities eased pandemic restrictions, the national multifamily vacancy rate dropped to 2.4% its lowest reading on record. Housing shortages and increasing unaffordability in cities have become a growing national concern. But according to CBRE, office demand did not have the same bounce back. The virtual work era lingers and office vacancy rates actually continue to rise. And shifting demand for higher quality office spaces with modern amenities, modern structures like higher ceilings and more usable rooftops are leaving some older buildings that lack these features stranded with very few interested tenants. As a result, the U.S. is seeing an unprecedented rise in conversions and adaptive reuse of office buildings that especially are in cities that have more older buildings. Manhattan, Denver, Portland, Seattle, San Francisco, it's a real opportunity. In San Francisco, for example, Gensler estimates that just 12 historic office buildings there could create 2,775 new housing units. You know, and as we've all heard in the news recently, the increase of housing in these heavy urban areas actually helps decrease crime. Uh, New York City's mayor, Eric Adams' administration, uh, says that their city's potential conversions could yield 20 thousand new apartments housing 40,000 people in some of the highest demand parts of the city. These conversions will require complex and highly innovative architectural design solutions. You know, making these adaptations is a challenge because it is a complex set of existing conditions. We need good tools for figuring out what the best reuse solutions are for each specific building.
Brian, let's talk about a fourth trend that we're really seeing data driven and AI driven design. We can't talk about any of this without talking about technology. And we need to do more than just use software for the solution. You know, we really need to consider the best way to take on data driven and AI driven approaches. And it's even changing business models of even architecture firms. You know, a recent article in Architectural Daily, it stated, architects must move away from being mere object creators and be more involved with the design of broader systems for our future. You know, systems thinking allows architects to recognize how the built world exists within social, environmental, and business networks, you know, which are changing at a rate that traditional architecture must rush to support. Business models, again, are really changing for designers. Rather than employing sustainable design elements as a method of greenwashing, architects must develop a deeper understanding of eco-architecture through a systems approach. Data plays a very critical role here. We can use it to benchmark existing strategies and model new solutions. If we can become more data-driven, we can deliver on the promise of sustainable buildings. We'll be showing you some of those data-driven and AI-driven approaches throughout the week, and we'll be providing some insight and guidance as how you should learn about or adopt certain tools. You know, as we go through the sustainability challenge, set aside the time to not just get inspired, but to go ahead and take some action this week. And if you have any comments, questions, put those down in the video comments. We're gonna have a great dialogue, not just this week, but going forward.